Chapter Twenty Four, Part Three of Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Twenty Four, The Hundred Years' War, Charles the Seventh and Joan of Arc. 1422 to 1462, Part Three. Charles no longer hesitated. Joan was treated, according to her own expression in her letter to the English, as a war chief. There were assigned to her a squire, a page, two heralds, a chaplain, brother Pasquerel, of the order of the Hermit Brotherhood of St. Augustine, varlets, and serving folk. A complete suit of armor was made to fit her. Her two guides, John of Metz and Bertrand of Poligny, had not quitted her, and the king continued them in her train. Her sword he wished to be supplied by himself. She asked for one marked with five crosses. It would be found, she said, behind the altar in the chapel of St. Catherine de Fierbois, where she had halted on her arrival at Chinon, and there indeed it was found. She had a white banner made, studded with lilies, bearing the representation of God seated upon the clouds, and holding in his hand the globe of the world. Above there were the words, Jesu Maria, and below were two angels, on their knees in adoration. Joan was fond of her sword, as she said two years afterwards at her trial, but she was forty times more fond of her banner, which was, in her eyes, the sign of her commission and the pledge of victory. On the completion of the preparations, she demanded the immediate departure of the expedition. Orléans was crying for succor, Dunois was sending messenger after messenger, and Joan was in a greater hurry than anybody else. More than a month elapsed before her anxieties were satisfied. During this interval we find Charles the Seventh and Joan of Arc at Chateauherault, at Poitiers, at Tours, at florent les Samur, at Chinon, and at Blois, going to and fro through all that country to push forward the expedition resolved upon, and to remove the obstacles it encountered. Through a haze of vague indications, a glimpse is caught of the struggle which was commencing between the partisans and the adversaries of Joan, and in favor of or in opposition to the impulse she was communicating to the war of nationality. Charles the Seventh's mother-in-law, Yolande of Aragon, Queen of Sicily, and the young Duke of Alencon, whose father had been killed at the Battle of Agincourt, were at the head of Joan's partisans. Yolande gave money and took a great deal of trouble in order to promote the expedition, which was to go and succor Orléans. The Duke of Alencon, hardly twenty years of age, was the only one amongst the princes of the House of Valois who had given Joan a kind reception on her arrival, and who, together with the brave La Hire, said that he would follow her whithersoever she pleased to lead him. Joan, in her gratitude, called him the handsome Duke, and exhibited towards him amity and confidence. But side by side with these friends, she had an adversary in the king's favorite, George de la Tremoille, an ambitious courtier, jealous of any one who seemed within the range of the king's favor, and opposed to a vigorous prosecution of the war, since it hampered him in the policy he wished to keep up toward the Duke of Burgundy. To the ill will of la Tremoille was added that of the majority of courtiers enlisted in the following of the powerful favorite, and that of warriors irritated at the importance acquired at their expense by a rustic and fantastic little adventuress. Here was the source of the enmities and intrigues which stood in the way of all Joan's demands, rendered her successes more tardy, difficult, and incomplete, and were one day to cost her more dearly still. At the end of about five weeks the expedition was in readiness. It was a heavy convoy of revictualment, protected by a body of ten or twelve thousand men, commanded by Marshal de Boussac, and numbering amongst them Zantray and La Hire. The march began on the 27th of April, 1429. Joan had caused the removal of all women of bad character, and had recommended her comrades to confess. She took the communion in the open air, before their eyes, and a company of priests, headed by her chaplain, Pasquerel, led the way whilst chanting sacred hymns. Great was the surprise amongst the men-at-arms. Many had words of mockery on their lips. It was the time when the higher used to say, if God were a soldier, he would turn robber. Nevertheless, respect got the better of habit. The most honorable were really touched. 
the coarsest considered themselves bound to show restraint. On the twenty-ninth of April they arrived before Orléans. But in consequence of the road they had followed, the Loire was between the army and the town. The expeditionary corps had to be split in two. The troops were obliged to go and feel for the bridge of Blois in order to cross the river, and Joan was vexed and surprised. Dunois, arrived from Orléans in a little boat, urged her to enter the town that same evening. "'Are you the bastard of Orléans?' asked she, when he accosted her. "'Yes, and I am rejoiced at your coming. "'Was it you who gave counsel for making me come hither by this side of the river, "'and not the direct way, over yonder, where Talbot and the English were? "'Yes, such was the opinion of the wisest captains. "'In the name of God, the counsel of my lord is wiser than yours. "'You thought to deceive me, and you have deceived yourselves, "'for I am bringing you the best succour that ever had knight or town or city, "'and that is the good will of God, and succour from the king of heaven.' Not assuredly for love of me, it is from God only that it proceeds. It was a great trial for Joan to separate from her comrades. So well prepared, penitent, and well disposed in their company, said she, I should not fear the whole power of the English. She was afraid that disorder might set in amongst the troops, and that they might break up, instead of fulfilling her mission. Dunois was urgent for her to go herself at once into Orléans with such portion of the convoy as boats might be able to transport thither without delay. Orléans, said he, would count it for naught, if they received the victuals without the maid. Joan decided to go. The captains of her division promised to rejoin her at Orléans. She left them her chaplain, Pasquerel, the priest who accompanied him, and the banner around which she was accustomed to muster them. And she herself, with Dunois, La Hire, and two hundred men-at-arms, crossed the river at the same time with a part of the supplies. The same day, at eight p.m., she entered the city on horseback, completely armed, preceded by her own banner, and having beside her Dunois, and beside her the captains of the garrisons of several of the most distinguished burgesses of Orléans, who had gone out to meet her. The population, one and all, rushed thronging round her, carrying torches, and greeting her arrival, with joy as great as if they had seen God come down amongst them. They felt, says the journal of the siege, all of them recomforted, and, as it were, disbesieged by the divine virtue which they had been told existed in this simple maid. In their anxiety to approach her, to touch her, one of their lighted torches set fire to her banner. Joan disengaged herself with her horse as cleverly as it could have been done by the most skilful horseman, and herself extinguished the flame. The crowd attended her to the church whither she desired to go first of all to render thanks to God, and then to the house of John Boucher, the Duke of Orléans' treasurer, where she was received together with her two brothers and the two gentlemen who had been her guides from Valcalour. The treasurer's wife was one of the most virtuous city dames in Orléans, and from this night forth her daughter Charlotte had Joan for her bedfellow. A splendid supper had been prepared for her, but she would merely dip some slices of bread and wine in water. Neither her enthusiasm nor her success, the two greatest tempters to pride in mankind, made any change in her modesty and simplicity. The very day after her arrival she would have liked to go and attack the English in their Bastilles, within which they kept themselves shut up. La Hire was pretty much of her opinion, but Dunois and the captains of the garrison thought they ought to await the coming of the troops which had gone to cross the Loire of Blois and the supports which several French garrisons in the neighbourhood had received orders to forward to Orléans. Joan insisted. Sire de Gamache, one of the officers present, could not contain himself. Since ear is given, said he, to the advice of a wench of low degree, rather than to that of a knight like me, I will not bandy more words. When the time comes, it shall be my sword that will speak. I shall fall, perhaps, but the king and my own honour demand it, Henceforth I give up my banner and am nothing more than a poor esquire. I prefer to have for a master a nobleman rather than a girl who has heretofore been, perhaps, I know not what. He furled his banner and handed it to Dunois. Dunois, as sensible as he was brave, would not give heed either to the collar of Gamache or to the insistence of Joan, and, thanks to his intervention, they were reconciled on being induced to think better, respectively, of giving up the banner and ordering an immediate attack. Dunois went to Blois to hurry the movements of the division which had repaired thither, and his presence there was highly necessary, since Joan's enemies, especially the Chancellor Renaud, 
were nearly carrying a decision that no such reinforcement should be sent to Orléans. Dunois frustrated this purpose, and led back to Orléans, by way of Buse, the troops concentrated at Blois. On the 4th of May, as soon as it was known that he was coming, Joan, La Hire, and the principal leaders of the city, as well as of the garrison, went to meet him, and re-entered Orléans with him and his troops, passing between the Bastilles of the English, who made not even an attempt to oppose them. "'That is the sorceress yonder,' said some of the besiegers. Others asked if it were quite so clear that her power did not come to her from on high, and their commander, the Earl of Suffolk, being himself perhaps uncertain, did not like to risk it. Doubt produced terror, and terror inactivity. The convoy from Blois entered Orléans, preceded by Brother Pasquerel and the priests. Joan, whilst she was awaiting it, sent the English captains a fresh summons to withdraw conformably with the letter which she had already addressed to them from Blois, and the principal clauses of which were just now quoted here. They replied with coarse insults, calling her strumpet and cowgirl, and threatening to burn her when they caught her. She was very much moved by their insults, insomuch as to weep, but calling God to witness her innocence, she found herself comforted, and expressed it by saying, I have had news from my lord. The English had detained the first herald she had sent them, and when she would have sent them a second to demand his comrade back, he was afraid. In the name of God, said Joan, they will do no harm, nor to thee, nor to him. Thou shalt tell Talbot to arm, and I too will arm. Let him show himself in front of the city. If he can take me, let him burn me. If I discomfit him, let him raise the siege, and let the English get them gone to their own country. The second herald appeared to be far from reassured, but Dunois charged him to say that the English prisoners should answer for what was done to the heralds from the maid. The two heralds were sent back. Joan made up her mind to iterate in person to the English the warnings she had given them in her letter. She mounted upon one of the bastions of Orléans, opposite the English Bastille called Tournelle, and there, at the top of her voice, she repeated her counsel to them to be gone, else woe and shame would come upon them. The commandant of the Bastille, Sir William Gladsdale, called by Joan and the French chroniclers, Gassiades, answered with the usual insults, telling her to go back and mind her cows, and alluding to the French as miscreants. "'You lie,' cried Joan, "'and in spite of you shall soon ye depart hence. Many of your people shall be slain, but as for you, you shall not see it.' Dunois, the very day of his return to Orléans, after dinner, went to call upon Joan, and told her that he had heard on his way that Sir John Falstaff, the same who on the twelfth of the previous February had beaten the French in the herring affair, was about to arrive with reinforcements and supplies for the besiegers. "'Bastard, bastard,' said Joan, "'in the name of God I command thee, as soon as thou shalt know of this Pascot's coming, to have me warned of it. For, should he pass without my knowing of it, I promise thee that I will have thy head cut off.' Dunois assured her that she should be warned. Joan was tired with the day's excitement. She threw herself upon her bed to sleep, but unsuccessfully. All at once she said to Sir Dolon, her esquire, "'My counsel doth tell me to go against the English, but I know not whether against their Bastilles or against this Foscot. I must arm.' Her esquire was beginning to arm her when she heard it shouted in the street that the enemy were at that moment doing great damage to the French. "'My God!' said she, "'the blood of our people is running on the ground. Why was I not awakened sooner? Ah, it is ill done. My arms! My arms! My horse!' Leaving behind her esquire, who was not yet armed, she went down. Her page was playing at the door. "'Ah, naughty boy,' said she, "'not to come and tell me that the blood of France was being shed. "'Come, quick, my horse!' It was brought to her. She bade them hand down to her by the window her banner, which she had left behind, and without any further waiting she departed and went to the Burgundy Gate, whence the noise seemed to come. Seeing on her way one of the townsmen passing who was being carried off wounded, she said, "'Alas! I never see a Frenchman's blood, but my hair stands up upon my head.' It was some of the Orleanese themselves who, without consulting their chiefs, had made a sortie and attacked the Bastille saint Loup, the strongest held by the English on this side. The French had been repulsed, and were falling back in flight when Joan came up, and soon after her Dunois and a throng of men-at-arms who had been warned of the danger— the fugitives returned to the assault. The battle was renewed with ardor. The Bastille of St. Loup, 
notwithstanding energetic resistance on the part of the English who manned it, was taken, and all its defenders were put to the sword before Talbot and the main body of the besiegers could come up to their assistance. Joan showed sorrow that so many people should have died unconfessed, and she herself was the means of saving some who had disguised themselves as priests in gowns, which they had taken from the church of St. Luke. Great was the joy in Orléans, and the enthusiasm for Joan was more lively than ever. Her voices had warned her, they said, and apprised her that there was a battle, and then she had found by herself alone, without any guide, the way to the Burgundy Gate. Men-at-arms and burgesses all demanded that the attack upon the English Bastille should be resumed, but the next day, the 5th of May, was Ascension Day. Joan advocated Lyon's repose on this holy festival, and the general feeling was in accord with her own. She recommended her comrades to fulfill their religious duties, and she herself received the communion. The chiefs of the besieged resolved to begin on the morrow a combined attack upon the English Bastilles which surrounded the palace, but Joan was not in their councils. "'Tell me what you have resolved,' she said to them. "'I can keep this and greater secrets.' Dunois made her acquainted with the plan adopted, of which she fully approved, and on the morrow, the 6th of May, a fierce struggle began again all around Orléans. For two days the Bastilles erected by the besiegers against the place were repeatedly attacked by the besieged. On the first day Joan was slightly wounded in the foot. Some disagreement arose between her and Sire de Gaucourt, governor of Orléans, as to continuing the struggle, and Jean Boucher, her host, tried to keep her back the second day. "'Stay and dine with us,' said he, "'to eat that shad which has just been brought. "'Keep it for supper,' said Joan. "'I will come back this evening and bring you some goddams, Englishmen, or other to eat his share.' And she sallied forth, eager to return to the assault. On arriving at the Burgundy Gate she found it closed. The governor would not allow any sortie thereby to attack on that side. "'Ah, naughty man,' said Joan, "'you are wrong. Whether you will or no, our men-at-arms shall go and win on this day, as they have already won.' The gate was forced, and men-at-arms and burgesses rushed out from all quarters to attack the Bastille of Tournelle, the strongest of the English works. It was ten o'clock in the morning. The passive and active powers of both parties were concentrated on this point, and for a moment the French appeared weary and downcast. Joan took a scaling ladder, set it against the rampart, and was the first to mount. There came an arrow and struck her between neck and shoulder, and she fell. Sire de Gamache, who had but lately displayed so much temper towards her, found her where she lay. "'Take my horse,' said he, "'and bear no malice. I was wrong. I had formed a false idea of you.' "'Yes,' said Joan, "'and bear no malice. I never saw a more accomplished knight.' She was taken away and had her armour removed. The arrow, it is said, stood out almost half a foot behind. There was an instant of faintness and tears, but she prayed and felt her strength renewed, and pulled out the arrow with her own hand.' Some one proposed to her to charm the wound by means of cabalistic words. But I would rather die, said she, than so sin against the will of God. I know full well that I must die some day, but I know nor where, nor when, nor how. If without sin my wound may be healed, I am right willing. A dressing of oil and lard was applied to the wound, and she retired apart into a vineyard, and was continually in prayer. Fatigue and discouragement were overcoming the French, and the captains ordered the retreat to be sounded. Joan begged Dunois to wait a while. "'My God,' said she, "'we shall soon be inside. Give your people a little rest, eat, and drink.' She resumed her arms and remounted her horse. Her banner floated in the air. The French took fresh courage. The English, who thought Joan half dead, were seized with surprise and fear, and one of their principal leaders, Sir William Gladesdale, made up his mind to abandon the outwork which he had hitherto so well kept, and retire within the Bastille itself. Joan perceived his movement. "'Yield thee!' she shouted to him from afar. "'Yield thee to the King of Heaven! Ah, Glaciades, thou hast basely insulted me, but I have great pity on the souls of thee and thine.' The Englishman continued his retreat. Whilst he was passing over the drawbridge which reached from the outwork to the Bastille, a shot from the side of Orléans broke down the bridge. Gladesdale fell into the water and was drowned, together with many of his comrades. The French got into the Bastille without any fresh fighting, and Joan re-entered Orléans amidst the joy and acclamations of the people. The bells rang all through the night, and the Te Deum was chanted. The day of combat was about to be succeeded by the day of deliverance. 
End of chapter 24, part 3.